Okay, welcome to lecture five, where we start looking at two-way analysis of variance. In this case, we're doing it with factorials. Um, two-way indicates that there's going to be two independent variables. Up until this point, we've looked at one-way ANOVA, where the one again indicates one independent variable. So instead of just one independent variable, we're going with two now. And I'm going to start off with four definitions, um, because that's what section, I think it's, we're in chapter nine, I believe it's section nine two. So the first definition is what it means to be a factorial design. Definition is that responses observed for there are responses observed for every combination of factory levels. Responses are the y variable. Um, responses observed means that we've tested and measured y values at every combination of factor levels. So variable A has A, B, C, and D as possible levels, and variable D, uh, B has 1, 2, and 3 possible levels. Um, then we're going to have to observe responses for every combination. So we need to observe a response for cell A1, where A is A and B is 1 for B1, C1, D1, uh, A2, B2, C2, D2, then A3, B3, C3, D3. And we should also observe more than once. We don't have to in order for it to be a factorial design but we should observe at least twice because that gives us a better estimator for our overall variance. So uh, responses observed for every single combination of the factor levels. And as before, let's also define balanced design. Number of observations in each combination is the same. So it's a balanced design if we observe 3 in A1, 3 in B1, 3 in C1, 3 in D1, 3 in A2, 3 in B2, 3 in C2, 3 in D2, 3 in A3, 3 in B3, 3 in C3. I'm already there, might as well go all the way. C in 3 in C in D3. It's not balanced if I have 3 in A1, 2 in A1, 3 in A, etc. Number of observations is the same in each for each combination. Now, I do want to tell you this. That's a really good simplifying assumption. When we do things by hand, we will make that assumption because it makes the math a lot easier to understand. However, computer programs don't require this anymore. Computer program, you stick in an unbalanced design, it's able to do the estimation. We personally can't if we're doing it by hand. So the balanced versus unbalanced design really comes down to not much of a difference since we're using computers. With that said, balanced designs tend to be better in terms of power, but not by much. Main effects. A main effect is the difference in mean responses across each factor. Here's the most important part. 
when viewed individually. That is, if you're looking at the main effects for variable A, you have to hold the values in variable B, only two ways, so only one other variable, variable B constant. You can't change both A and B and talk about main effects. For main effects, you only get to change one of the two variables. We're looking at two-way design. There's two independent variables, so we can talk about the main effect for variable A or the mean effect for variable C. The mean effect for variable A is the difference in the mean responses across A when you hold C constant. And the main effects for C is the difference in the mean responses across the levels of C when you hold A constant. Now, if both change, then you're looking at something called interaction effects. According to the book, these are differences or inconsistencies. Synonyms. Inconsistency means not consistent, means it changes, means it's different. Of the main effect, one or more other factors. So it's how much, in our example here, it's how much the, much the effect of A changes with respect to a changing C. If A doesn't change when C changes, then there is no interaction. If the effect of A, let's draw some Here's the effect of A as A goes from 1, 2, to 3. Notice that the effect of A when C is equal to 1 is much greater as you go from 1 to 2 to 3 than if C is equal to 3 as you go from 1 to 2 to 3. There is an interaction between these two factors, between the A factor and the C factor. If these lines, segments, were parallel, the slope of this line, doesn't change with C. Still, not much of an effect. A doesn't change, have much effect on the observations, regardless of what value C is. By the way, these are called profile plots. Similarly, This also illustrates no interaction because the effect of A, the slope, is the same, the effect is the same regardless of the level of C. Same slope regardless of what C is. Therefore, there's no interaction. 
Again, here is an example of an interaction. The effect of A, again the slope, changes for the different levels of C. That's an interaction. And that's section one, or maybe that's section two, I don't know. Let's look at the model now. had just one independent variable subscripts on the obser observations for i and j. Here, since we have two, it's going to be i, j, k. We're going to do this in terms of the effects model. So we have an overall mean. That's the effect of A. That's gamma. That's the effect of C. That's the interaction effect. That's the effect of A that changes with C, or that's the effect of C that changes with A. And that's the random variation. Note that the expected value of uh, Y, I, J, K is equal to mu plus alpha I plus gamma J plus alpha gamma I, J. Don't think of that as alpha times gamma. I think of this as a completely different variable. Um, the variance of y, i, j, k is equal to sigma squared, the variance of the epsilons. Um, this is actually one of the assumptions. Same assumption that we had back in the one-way analysis variance. The distribution of yijk is going to be normal, because we're also making the assumption that the epsilons are normally distributed with mean zero. on the right up there, if we go back to the one where there was no interaction effect, if there's no interaction, then this term is zero. If there is an interaction, that term is not zero. Again, think of alpha gamma here as being one variable. Think of that like being a beta. But we do want to use alpha gamma to emphasize that this last term is a function of both alpha and gamma. Anything else I need to talk about? Yes. So we got the same assumptions, normality and homoscedasticity. We're going to assume that I goes from 1 to A, that there are A levels in the alpha variable. We're going to assume that J goes from 1 to uh, no, C. There we go. So there are C levels in that gamma variable. And we're going to assume that K goes from 1 to N. So there are N replications in each of those cells. We're going to assume balanced design. If we wanted to make this an unbalanced design, we'd have to have subscripts on the N and a lot more algebra than I want to do, than the book does. Alpha, gamma, then the K. I think that's the end of 9.3. Okay, so that's the end of 9.3. That's the end of the introduction. All right, the first step is going to be for us to look at the between cell analysis, sometimes called the test for the model. This is section 9.3.4, by the way. The test for the model. 
And what between cell analysis does is it looks to see if there is a significant difference in the cell counts or the cell values. I'm sorry. It would be counts if you were doing counts as your dependent variable. If there is no significant difference in the cell averages, then there, the model, the null hypothesis model will be the appropriate one, that there is no difference. Um, so this is usually the very first step, look to see if there is a difference in the counts. In other words, we're looking to see if the yijk is just equal to some grand mean plus some random variation. So let's break this up into its sums of squares, because as this analysis of variance, everything comes down to the NOVA table. First thing we ought to look at is the total sum of squares. Same as always. This is just that should be C. The difference between, or the squared difference between the observation and the overall mean. It's the same as it was back in the one way ANOVA case. Now, remember the degrees of freedom for the total sum of squares? Now we had to estimate just one parameter. So this is going to be a, c, and minus 1. That's just the total sample size, by the way. So as in the one-way case, the degrees of freedom for the total is again going to be sample size minus 1. Second one will be the sum of squares cells. And why are we doing sum of, sw sum of square cells? because this is a between cell analysis. So we need to again look at the sums. But what are we, uh, what is the summation that we're going to look at? We're going to look at the average in each of the cells, measure that deviation from the overall mean. Think of that for a second. And by the way, I'm writing this out longhand because I want to emphasize that there is something going on here. This K again is the number of replications within each cell. This goes across all the levels of gamma, and this goes across all the levels of alpha. So this Y bar IJ dot is just the average in that cell IJ. And this Y bar dot 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 is just the overall average. Degrees of freedom for cells. We can write this in a couple ways. Uh, we can do this in terms of n minus some sort of uh, something that uh, number n capital n minus the number of parameters we have to estimate. Or we can write it like this. Why? Well, how many parameters did we have to estimate? We had to estimate this one. And we had to estimate these k. And that's what this actually comes out to be. You got freedom from all the i's, freedom from all the j's, but we have to take off one additional because, boom, we had to estimate this. Those aren't y. The real reason why is it's the math to make these unbiased estimators, but I'm paid to say that that's the reason. SSW or SSE, the book keeps using SSW. I really want to call this sum of squared errors because in just about every other textbook you're going to, or source, you're going to talk about sum of squared errors. But I'm going to stick with SSW for now. So SSW is going to be the total sum of squares minus the sum of squared cells. It's what's left over of the variation after you apply the model the same as it was back in the one-way case. Here, again, note that the sum of squared errors and the sum of squared cells are independent. That it implies that the f-test 
is valid. F requires two types of degrees of freedom. Numerator is going to be AC minus 1. Denominator is going to be AC times N minus 1. Perform this test. If your test statistic is too small, that is, you fail to reject your null hypothesis, what we're actually saying is there's not much variation inside the cells. Not much variation inside the cells. I'm sorry. There's not much variation between the cells. Wow, that was totally wrong. I'd go back and delete this out, but that takes way too much work. If f is small, that means sum of squared cells is small, which means that the sum of squares between the cells is very small. Not much variation between the cell averages. Or the sum of squared within, the remaining error is incredibly large. Either way, either of those will cause the f statistic to be small. Fail to reject the null hypothesis. That's 934. Not much difference between this and one-way analysis of variance. We spent a lot of time talking about one-way analysis of variance because its concepts are very much applicable to all levels of ANOVA. So that's, that's 934. I'm going to start 935 in just a moment. In 934, we looked at the sum of squared for the cells. We did a, a, a total model test. In this section, 935, we're going to do a uh, factorial analysis where we're going to look at the actual effect of the levels, the A variable, the C variable, and more importantly, the interaction, the AC variable. So don't forget the following. The expected value of cell IJ is equal to the overall mean plus the effect of I plus the effect of J plus, uh, can't talk and write Greek at the same time, plus that interaction effect. That's going to be our, the, the expected value of mu sub ij. Don't forget that. we got three null hypotheses that we can test sometimes. One is that all the alphas, i's are zero, which means variable a has no effect. The other is that all the gamma j's are zero, which means the variable C has no effect. And the third is that the, there we go, that the alpha gamma, the interactions are all zero, meaning that there is no interaction effect. We have to t uh, test it from the bottom up, though. Well, technically, you have to test the interaction first. If there is no interaction, then we can test the main effects. But the interaction is one we have to focus on first. And as with the one-way analysis of variance, First step is to, and as with the last case, the first step is to determine the sums of squares. And as before, total sum of square is equal to the sum Degrees of freedom A is the number of levels in the variable A, C is the number of level of number of levels in the variable C, N is the number of levels in the oh no, N is the number of replications in each cell. Notice there are no subscripts on the tops. That means that A does not depend the number of levels in A is independent of the number of levels in C, and more importantly, that the number of replications is the same in each cell. I've never come across an A and a C that are subscripted. When you have an unbalanced design, these Ns have to be subscripted with an I and a J to indicate the number of replications in that IJ cell. Now let's look at the sum of squares due to A. Now before we do that, let's, let's stop and think. This is going to be equal to, again, we're going to add up over all of the observations. You'd think I'd get faster at writing those three summations, but I don't. 
and it's going to be the effect of A. So since we're looking at the effect of A and ignoring the effects of the interaction and of, of C, the sum of square or the squares here is just going to have A or the I's vary. I guess I gotta put it more on top of that. Again, the I is left, the J's and K's are, are dotted now. Because the I, the Y bar I is going to be the average for all of the alphas of I. So if I is equal to 1, as you start out, this is going to be the average over all the B's and over all the C's and over all the J's and K's of those A effects, of that A equal 1 effect. So that means that SSC, sum of squares for variable C, is going to be equal to Since C is the second variable, the J is going to be the only remaining letter. So this will be the sum of squares for variable A, the sum of squares for variable C. And this last one is going to be the sum of squares for the interaction. means that there's a lot of things coming. Now realize that this interaction has to contain all of, of, of all of the total sum of squares that aren't described by the sum of squares A's and sum of squares C. Um, that's why this is going to be rather complicated. So this is going to equal y i j dot minus y bar dot 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 which makes sense. I mean, the A and the C's are, are varying, so the I's and the J's. But because this also contains an A effect and a C effect, we also have to subtract off those. This might be the surprising part. Um, be aware that, again, this is the interaction. It has the interaction effect, the variable it, which I already erased. It has the variable alpha gamma. It also has the variable alpha and the variable gamma. Remember the expected value in each cell is mu plus alpha omega plus gamma j plus this alpha gamma ij. Here's the alpha gamma, but that alpha gamma also affects the alpha and the gamma. Here's the alpha gamma, but you also have to take off the effect of alpha and the effect of gamma. And there's a way of simplifying that this definition means something. Oh, degrees of freedom. Um, a minus 1, C minus 1, and this will be A minus 1 times C minus 1. Hopefully I'm not up the edge. Why is this A minus 1? You gain A degrees of freedom, but you have to subtract off 1 because you're estimating this. You have C degrees of freedom because there's C of those J's, and you're subtracting off 1 there. And this could be written out in a similar way, but it simplifies a minus 1 times c minus 1. Because this is actually a c minus 1. a minus 1, c minus 1. 
And if you do that simplification, this actually comes out to be a minus 1 times c minus 1. Now I'd love to jump straight into F-tests, but there is one step between here and those F-tests that's kind of important. And right now you may think, okay, I can do a sum of square, I can test for the main effect of A just by taking the ratio of the mean squared A to the mean squared total. It doesn't quite work that way because this interaction effect is, in, is intervening. But the mean squared interaction divided by mean squared total is, is, is totally, uh, well, no, that won't work either. Hmm, so how could we determine what the correct ratios are? <sighs> well, that's section 935. 936, I believe, we look to see what those ratios, the appropriate ratios are by focusing on something called the, mean, the expected mean squared. So in the next section, we're going to look at, the, calculate the expected mean squared A and the expected mean squared C and the expected mean squared interaction. And by looking at that and thinking through what each of the parts means, what each of the parts indicates, we'll be able to determine which, interact, which ratios are appropriate. So that'll be the next part. And now for section 936, um, expected mean squareds. I'm going to start out with the expected mean squared A. That's just equal to sigma squared plus the ratio of Cn over A minus 1. Where did that come from? There's a video in D2L showing you how to do this or showing you the proof. Please watch through it. You will not be tested on how to actually prove this, because there is a whole lot of algebra there. But look through it just to prove to yourself that this is true. Okay, welcome back. So what does this actually mean? It means the expected value of MSA, the expected value of the mean squared for variable A. Remember, mean squared is a type of variation. It's a type of variance. So the expected value of that variance for A is equal to the total variance, the variance of the epsilons, plus this part over on the right. If A has no effect, that means that all the alpha i's are zero. If all the alpha i's are zero, then this is zero, then this is zero, which means the expected value of that MSA is sigma squared. Expected value of the mean squared for variable c is just, again, that sigma squared plus a n over c minus 1 times the sum of the squared gammas. So if c has no effect, that means all the gammas are equal to 0. That means that this summation, the second part, is 0, which means the expected mean squared is sigma squared. And by the way, in the book on page... Where are we? It gives a way of remembering these. Maybe. No, I guess it doesn't. Yeah. So we'll go with how I remember it. Um, so this is mean squared. This is just going to be sigma squared plus some function. Since it's AC, it's going to be some function of the alpha gamma. Uh, K equals 1 to N alpha gamma. Squared. And that's not right. Should be something with the i's and j's. That's better. And then what gets 
gets put in front. Well, when we were summing over the A's, we had A minus 1 in the denominator, and when we were doing it over the C's, we had the C minus 1. Since we're doing it both over the A's and the C's, that goes in the denominator. What goes on top is A, C, N. Find it out by whatever's in the bottom. So we were summing over the A's, A, C, N, so we dropped the A from the top. Here we were summing over the C's, A, C, N, so we dropped the C from the top. Here we're uh, summing over the A's and the C's, so A, C, N, we're dropping the A and the C from the top. Now notice here, oh, I did it right. And again, remember this alpha gamma is just one number. It's not a product. Just emphasizing that, that this variable depends on both alpha and gamma. So if there is no interaction, that means this alpha gamma for every single one of those ij's is equal to zero. Which means that this is going to equal zero. Which means that the expected mean squared for the interaction is going to just equal that sigma squared. And what is that sigma squared? And uh, the book calls this a w. And that's it. Expected value of the mean squared error is just sigma squared. This is the variance of those epsilons. Remember? Make sure you get these copied down or figure out how to create them for a two-way factorial design. If it's not balanced, then this math is nowhere nearly as easy as this. The rules of thumb don't work because these ends are going to be all subscripted for both i and for j, which means that the numerator and denominator are going to be completely different from what, well, the numerator is going to be completely different from what we've got. But we're working with balanced designs to make the math a little bit easier, a lot easier. OK, so why did we get into this? The reason we got into this was to determine um, which ratios we should use to test which effects. And the key here is mean squared error is always going to be in the denominator. Notice I made the made it clear on each of these cases, if these last parts are all zero, then the expected mean squares are going to just be those sigma squared. So the ratios of like MSA to MSW, its expected value is going to be 1. Sigma squared over sigma squared. So here are the two rules, or the one rule, I just gave you one thing. Um, if I want to test the null hypothesis, uh, I think I started with that. All the alphas are zero. Then in denominator, we're going to do MSW. And the numerator, what can we do? Well, if we do this one, then we're going to be looking at the alpha gammas. So we should actually do the MSA as you expected. But notice, oops, I'm going to put it approximately there. It's going to be approximately equal to 1 plus Cn over A minus 1 times the sum of those alpha i squareds over sigma squared. It's not equal, but it's approximately equal. So let's look at this second term for a moment. If that residual variation is very large, if that sigma squared is humongous, this is going to be close to 0, which means our f value is going to be close to 1, which means we'll fail to reject. 
if our sigma squared is really small, tiny, teeny weeny, this will be very large. So our F ratio will be very large. And we will be able to reject the null hypothesis. Notice how those statements dealt only with the sigma squares. What is that sigma squared? It's that unexplained variation. So if we can get that unexplained variation to be very small, we're going to have a much more powerful test. If this unexplained variation is large, then our test is going to be very low power. How do we affect the variation? Well, this is due to two things. One is this is due to the natural variation in what we're measuring. We can't affect that. Two, it's due to a lot of other variables that we're not using. We can fix that. What did I just say? better understand that, let's go back to our one-way analysis of variance. I apologize, I'm going to make this Y sub IK, but when we were doing this originally it was IJ. I'm going to keep it K because that K, again, in this case is going to reflect the number of replications in each of the cells just as the K does up there. Ready? Put that much space. That was the one-way ANOVA. We're trying to explain a dependent variable using just one categorical variable, A. Here's the two-way. Copy down from up there. Okay, again, it's going to be replications within each cell. Only now we've got a two dimensional table. Here we had a just one dimensional. Those two reflect reality. There is just one U, there is just one alpha I in the population. Those are not random variables. They are identically the same as these. So where do, does the gamma J and the alpha gamma IJ come from? It comes from the epsilon IKs. And again, the y's are all the same. Those are equal. So this epsilon ik, we partitioned it into three parts. We partitioned it into an effect of variable c, an interaction effect of a and c, and then whatever is left over. This is a constant. This is a constant. This is random, just as that was random. And to be clear, what I mean by constant is that it's not a random variable. We don't know what the value is, but there is one set value in the population. This is random, and it was broken up into these three parts, two of which are not random. That means that this epsilon ijk has a smaller variance than this epsilon ik. Adding in that additional variable and its interaction reduced that unexplained variation. So even though we called the variation of this sigma squared and the variation of this sigma squared, they're two different sigma squares. This upper sigma squared includes this. So this second sigma squared is actually smaller, which gives us a more powerful test. Adding in more and more and more variables will ensure that this epsilon ijk 
has a variance that gets smaller and smaller and smaller to a point. To the point that you now have the natural variation that can't be reduced. So if we recall the expected value of that f, How can we make this sigma squared small? And we do want to make this sigma squared small. But this sigma squared is the residual variation. So all we have to do is make this variation small by making sure that we use the correct variables. That's a sigma. And that's it. That's section 936. I believe section 937 talks about balanced design or unbalanced data, there we go. 937 talks about unbalanced data. Computer can handle that. We could, if we wanted to spend the extra 10, 14 hours trying to figure it out, we could do it ourselves. Um, on the board we're going and on the test, we're going to be using balanced data because it makes the calculations a lot easier. Computer, however, can handle that unbalanced data. So that's it. Where do you go from here? Well, if you're an R person, you go to the R lecture. If you're a SAS person, you go to the SAS lecture. And that's it. This was factorial design, two-way analysis of variance. Hope you enjoyed it.